You elite hackers out there know the number 1337, but you also know the number 8200. Secure Ninja. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia Webb. Secure Ninja TV was recently in Tel Aviv, Israel to attend Cybertech 2017. One of the conference's speakers was Nadav Zafir, the former commander of Israel's Unit 8200. Israel Defense Forces Unit 8200 is an elite team of cyber spies known worldwide as some of the best in the business. We tried to get Zafir on camera for an interview, but he graciously declined. No worries, we have his entire presentation for you. Um, look, 2016, uh, uh, from my perspective, was a definitive year in uh, cybersecurity. Um, it's not a definitive year because we heard about some new exploits. Um, you know, we didn't hear about any heart bleed or bladder splash, uh, for that matter. Um, but still, I think when we look at the year in retrospect, uh, it's going to, we're going to look at it as a definitive year in the, the history of cybersecurity. And <clears throat> I think it's the year when the attackers have literally hit bare metal. In many ways, I think that it's the year where attackers realize that instead of going for the low-hanging fruit, they can literally cut down the trees. And in order to put this to life, let's take a short tour of what happened, of the big incidents of 2016, if you like. Let's start with December 2015, Western Ukraine, the lights are out. Now, given maybe in a small area for a short amount of time, but this is the first time that somebody literally takes the lights out. Now, we've heard of uh, other attacks on utilities in the past. We've had the energetic bear, and we've had the dancing yeti. But back then, we thought that those were campaigns that were directed at data theft. And this time, somebody actually took down the light, whilst the attackers never even came close to the turbines. Now, if you think about the technical way that uh, this was carried out, you're not going to see anything spectacular. Yes, this was a well carried out attack, but in reality, nothing spectacular. Um, you know, they did a spear phishing attack on the IT personnel. They were able to hijack the credentials. There was no two factor authentication. And from there, they were actually able to get to the control and open the breakers. By the way, if you want to look at something brilliant in this attack, it's not really how they turn the lights off but how they stopped the controllers from turning the lights back on, which was by cutting down the UPS, by rewriting the legit firmware on the Ethernet so that when the controllers tried to bring it back on, nothing, nothing happened. And if you think this is one of a kind, well, here comes the sequel. Exactly a year later, lights go out again. This time, the power distribution technically similar. February, Bangladesh, attackers go home with about $81 million from the Central Bangladesh Bank. I guess they figure instead of going from one system to the other and taking and then collecting money, why don't we just go to the Central Bank? And if you look at the technical part here again, it's not about the technical part, it's about the operational part. These guys were shrewd enough to sit in the network watch what's happening, understand that in this case, there are printers that actually make a hard copy printout of every transaction so somebody can follow it. They cut the printers. They did it on a Friday in Bangladesh, which is a Muslim country. By the time it went to the West, it was a weekend, Saturday and Sunday. By the way, they were after a billion dollars, except that when they were wiring the money to places like Sri Lanka and the Philippines, um, they made a mistake at the wiring address and misspelled foundation. They wrote foundation. A clerk in Deutsche Bank looked at that and said, that doesn't make sense. And that's how we got 80 million instead of a billion. And if it would have been a billion, this wouldn't be the first time that you've heard of it. Again, going back to the technical part, sort of a classic APT, right? There is the spear phishing, they go in. Um, a lot of you have heard about the $10 switch in the Bangladesh bank. And if you think the problem is there's the $10 switch, 
Well, think again. They were in the network for about six to 12 months. They were able to get assets, dozens of assets on the network before they jumped from one network to the secure network. And by the way, in the teammate labs, we did look into this and we found at least three, four other ways that they could have jumped the network. So it's not about a $10 switch, but it is about SWIFT, which is the critical digital infrastructure of the world. 200 countries, 11,000 subscribers. And the sequel is coming, we stopped counting, but it's going to happen. And if you think that attackers get their Oscars by uh, uh, being innovative or creative, well, not really, they're our, about ROI. And so expect the Mimikats to come and keep on attacking SWIFT networks uh, around the world. Now, so we've got the electric grid, check. We've got the SWIFT digital, check. Next one is a little bit uh, controversial, but I don't think we can talk about 2016 without speaking about the DNC. Again, look at it from the technical, you're not gonna see anything you didn't see already. We know spear phishing, and we've seen emails on the internet before these guys have been paying very careful attention to what's, what happened with the Sony attack. Except that in this case, they did something very shrewd. They used WikiLeaks as their broadcast station and they took bunch after bunch, batch after batch, cleverly putting it at the right time on the internet and you know the rest of the story. And then in October, Dean, no internet on the East Coast for almost a day. No Twitter, no Amazon. Technical, st technical story here is different. They start with creating a malware by the name of Mirai, which is intended for IoT. They then scan the internet to find entities on the IoT network that have the uh, default passwords. They get about 100,000 webcams and create a DDoS attack. And the internet is down. And now we're talking about the critical infrastructure. We're talking about the bare metal of the internet. Let's recap. Electricity, check. Digital infrastructure, check. The strongest democracy in the world, hacked, check. And then finally, the actual internet infrastructure. By the way, going back into the Dean attack, brings the phenomena that we like to call mix and match. And mix and match is important because it perhaps it gives you a little glimpse of what might happen in the near future. Why? Because if you think of this attack, the Dean attack, what are, what are we doing here? We're taking something that existed for from the beginning of the internet, right? DDoS has been there all. Combine that or mix and match that with IoT and you get a new vector of attack. And so you might think, what's next? Well, let's think about ransom. Ransom has been around as, as long as humankind has been around, probably. Um, but you mix and match ransom with computers, you get ransomware. Or maybe next, we'll see ransomware, right? You wake up in the morning, you get into a Tesla, and you can't drive to work if you don't pay the ransom. And what if it happens to multiple Teslas all at the same time? This could become a big problem, and you can continue to imagine where that can take us. By the way, if you think of it, if you want to be creative, just two days ago, I don't know if you read about this, it's a report about a hotel in Austria. Attackers were able, were able to get in, encrypt everything, nobody goes into the rooms, nobody goes out of the rooms if they don't pay their ransom, and guess what, they paid, they paid it with Bitcoin. So the question is, uh, uh, what's next? Right? Uh, if this is ransomware, let's, let's look into the future. So, in order to look at the future, let's go about 10 years back. I don't know if you remember, but about 10 years ago, there was a passion fruit mania in Israel. For the Israelis in the crowd, Pasiflora. Remember Pasiflora? Everything had Pasiflora, everything had passion fruit. We had passion fruit in our gardens, passion fruit in our salad, passion fruit in our ointments, and the one that I like most is passion fruit infused shampoo. I don't know if you remember that, but it does remind me of something that's happening right now. Right now, we have artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence is everywhere. 
right? We're going to see artificial intelligence in security. We're going to see artificial intelligence in our cars. We're going to see artificial intelligence in our homes. And it's going to infuse everything. And before you know it, and I know this will happen, you'll get artificial infused shampoo with Pasiflora. But seriously, if AI is the next thing, what does that mean about the attack surface? Well, what it means is that the attack surface is going to grow and grow. And so if you think about AI-induced world, what does that mean for the attackers? Well, the attackers are going to take advantage of that, just like they've done with everything else. So what you're going to see is attackers attacking the AI surface. So I use Alexa. What happens if somebody fishes my Alexa? Does that mean that they stole my identity? How do you do two-factor authentication for Alexa? <laughs> but the more interesting part is that every technology that's going to come out there is also going to benefit the attackers. And that's what we've got to think about. So think about the following. AI for attackers doing APT. You know, the one thing that we do have as defenders for advanced persistent threat is time, right? Because we all know the statistics. It takes about 6 to 12 months to do an advanced persistent threat attack. And so we have time, once we know something has happened, to react to that. <laughs> but what if attackers now use AI in their APT and an attack takes 30 seconds? Well, does that mean that the, investigate, the people in our socks, rather than becoming in being investigators become historians. And so, I, so we need to rethink the way we do this. Now, our systems, our networks are very complex. Networks of networks becoming more and more complex. However, our security philosophy is a Boolean philosophy. It's binary. We are either under attack or we're not. We are either infected or we're clean. We whitelist and we blacklist. And with all due respect to everything that we in the industry do, for the most part, what we're doing even with the best technologies that we have is we're trying to lower the probability of moving from one state to the other state, from being infected from being not infected to being infected. That's what we're doing. We're pushing it away all the time. And it starts to look like something like this. And so we are constantly layering ourselves with more and more security products that allow us to lower the probability of moving from one state to the other, which leads to a paradox of the security versus productivity as one example. I don't know how many of you work for large corporates in the crowd, but I can make a bet that if you work for a large corporate now, you've been whitelisted to death. And if you want to use Skype, for example, well, let's try. We actually see corporations that are taking their core assets and disconnecting them from the network. We actually see governments that are taking all government networks and disconnecting them from the network. I think this does not make sense. It does not make sense, and so we need to rethink how we come up with better solutions. And for that, allow me for 60 seconds before I summarize to move away from cyber, just for 60 seconds. Let's talk about tires. So for 150 years, the tire industry is trying to find a way to have a tire that cannot be punctured. And so we are finding better materials and better ways and better layers to create a tire that will keep the pressurized air inside. But these guys here, in this example, went to the bare metal and said, who said we need the pressurized air? Now, I know we're not in the tire industry, but I do think that we need to take some of these examples and rethink our cybersecurity paradigm. Now, let's talk about a couple of examples before I wrap up. Active Directory. Right? Very lucrative for attackers. Now, given we need our Active Directory, we need the information. But who says that the Active Directory might, must be centralized? Is it imperative? Or can we find a decentralized way to have our Active Directory in the future? Go to the bare metal, redesign it. 
centralization, let's go back to the DDoS. Is DNSSEC going to make our DNS apparatuses more secure? Yes. Are they going to make them resilient to DDoS? I don't think so. Now, do we have to remain in a centralized DDoS, uh, in a centralized DNS environment? Well, Thor has showed us that not actually not. And Bitcoin has showed us that, well, even our monetary systems don't have to be centralized and could be redesigned from the bottom up, going into the bare metal. And from network to infrastructure, let's go all the way down to the operating system. Do we have to continue this unending quest to get the perfect operating system that will never be infected? Or can we create an operating system where you don't really care if you're infected? Well, Microsoft is doing similar things, is taking this uh, uh, course of action with Edge, for example, and I can tell you that a teammate were trying to take this to the next level. Now, so going back to the beginning, I think 2016 has been a definitive year. I think the attackers have gone to the bare metal. I think as an industry, we must also go to the bare metal and create a system from the bottom up which leaves this binary notion of cybersecurity. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to subscribe to Secure Ninja TV so you don't miss any of the other content that we filmed at Cybertech in Israel, as well as some of the great content that we're filming right here at RSA 2017 in San Francisco. Leave us a comment below and let us know what you thought of the video, and we will see you next time. I'm Alicia Webb. Bye.